Welcome back to our online course, Understanding Doctrine and Introduction to Christian Theology. In this final introductory session of our course, we're looking at the how of Christian theology. How do we properly do theology? In asking the question that way, I mean two things. First, what sorts of spiritual commitments and character traits ought to be present when we are studying and living out biblical doctrine? What needs to be happening in our hearts? I'll call this the, the manner of doing theology. And then second, what are some of the actual steps that we need to take to synthesize the Bible's teaching on some area of doctrine and then apply it to our lives? I'll call this the method of doing theology. Now, you need to know that whole books have been written on the manner and method of Christian theology. Again, this is just an introductory course, and so we're going to keep it as simple as possible. So first, the manner of doing theology, and I'll, I'll mention five things here. Number one, we do theology by trusting Christ and being filled with the Spirit. Believe it or not, this is not as readily accepted as you might think. Beginning with the period of the Enlightenment around 1700 and well into modernity, people assumed that it was possible to achieve a purely objective point of view in every arena of knowledge, science, history, philosophy, and even in religious studies and theology, that we could be fully neutral, detached, and disinterested observers, flies on the wall, if you will, of some object that we wanted to examine or study. But such pure objectivity is not really possible in this life. We all bring certain presuppositions. That's a big word that just simply re refers to prior beliefs and commitments that we hold to be basic. We all bring certain presuppositions into every endeavor to find meaning and truth. Perhaps these presuppositions come from past study. Perhaps they come from our past experience. And these presuppositions don't mean that we can't study or arrive at truth or meaning, but it means that the process is not as simple as a scientific turning of the crank. We have to acknowledge these presuppositions openly. We have to put them out on the table and examine their fitness for the matter at hand. And potentially, we need to have our presuppositions changed and shaped, even by the object that we're seeking to study, so that we can understand it and receive it rightly. For example, imagine a young Christian seeking to learn more about God as Father for the very first time. But what if this young Christian had an earthly father who had been terribly abusive? I submit to you that initially, this young Christian is going to struggle to set aside faulty presuppositions about fatherhood. And by being filled with the Holy Spirit, he will need to adjust his presuppositions, his assumptions about fatherhood by trusting and embracing what God says about himself. But I also want to suggest that if this young person was not a Christian, it would be nearly impossible for him to adopt the outlook that the Bible provides, nor would he want to believe what the Bible has to say about who God is. Trusting Christ and being filled with the Holy Spirit is essential to doing theology rightly. This produces the right presuppositions and the desire to be changed by God as we meet him in scripture. Second, we do theology in prayer, constantly asking the Lord to open our eyes to understand truth from scripture, for the ability to put it all together and to receive it with joy and to live it out. So this flows from our first point. Theology is not a purely human, rationalistic activity. We are dealing with God's truth and reality. That's the subject matter at hand. And so we need his supernatural assistance. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural person, the Apostle Paul says, the natural person, that is a, a person in their natural spiritual state, in sin and without the Holy Spirit's empowering presence. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, 
So he rejects, for example, the reality of a crucified and resurrected Christ. For they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them. So not only does this natural person reject such truth claims, Paul says he cannot even properly understand them and their significance. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, it takes the Holy Spirit to open our minds and our hearts to God's truth and work. So, we need to pray to ask for the Holy Spirit to help us in this whole endeavor, from the studying and understanding piece to the living it out piece of doing theology. Number three, the manner of Christian theology. We do theology with great humility. There are a number of things that you're going to learn in this course that could lead to pride because you will gain some intellectual insight about Christianity and about its truth claims. Plus, you're going to learn a whole lot of new big words to go along with it. But always remember 1 Peter 5.5, 5, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So strive for humility as you engage in doing theology. This is God's truth. It's meant to master us. The point is not for us to master it and then boast of our accomplishment to others. So we do theology with humility. Fourth, we do theology with a little help from our friends. I hope you enjoy the Beatles reference there. Actually, we need a lot of help from others when we do theology. This is a communal project in at least two senses. First, we have a whole history of faithful Christian theologians and scholars who have gone before us. And it would be foolish not to research what they have said as we seek to do theology. More on that later. But there's a second sense here, and it's this. We're not meant to live any part of the Christian life alone. And that includes our theological endeavors and our studying and applying God's truth. We have to constantly be asking our church family, our brothers and sisters in Christ, is this way of thinking correct? Am I on, on a dangerous path when I think this way or talk this way? Am I really living out what I believe? Will you hold me accountable to God's truth and to God's word? Proverbs 11 verse 14, there is safety in a multitude of counselors. One other passage here, Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13. And here we learn that there are certain individuals given as gifts to Christ's church whose role is to help all of the saints grow into full maturity. And this includes teachers who are given by Christ so that you may grow and learn in ways that you couldn't on your own. So verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. As a whole, the church needs specific teachers so that we may all grow up into maturity and in Christ's likeness. So we must do theology with the help of others. Finally, number five, we do theology with praise and rejoicing. This is God's truth. He has graciously condescended to reveal himself to us. And it's his power that enables us to live all of this out. And so it's fitting that the entire process of theology should be one of worship and giving glory to God. Romans 11 verse 36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is the manner of Christian theology. Next, we want to talk about the method of Christian theology. What is the actual process of doing all of this? Again, we'll keep it simple. Six basic steps. First, we have to focus in on the specific doctrine by identifying the topic we want to explore. So, for example, am I trying to learn about prayer or baptism or sanctification or the person of the Holy Spirit? 
This is common sense, but it's very easy to lose focus once you dive into a subject and it pulls you in many other directions and possible rabbit trails. So identify the topic. And there also needs to be a conscious judgment made on the relative importance of the topic. Some topics are more important, and so they are worth wrestling over more deeply. The work of Christ, the gospel, and while other topics, like specific views on the end times, are much less important. And this will help govern the energy and the effort that we put toward different areas of doctrine. And then we need to clarify the key questions that we're seeking to answer. It's not enough to say, I want to explore salvation because it's such a wide topic. What are the specific questions you're seeking to explore? So perhaps, what is the basis of our salvation? How was our salvation achieved? What is the instrument that appropriates salvation to us as individuals? Or is salvation past, present, future, or all three of these? Those are some of the questions that you might seek to ask. Second, we then need to examine the biblical data in a proper way. Now, there's a lot that we could unpack here, but basically this is where we just need to spend a lot of time in the Bible finding any pertinent passage for our topic. There is no substitute here for reading the Bible in a disciplined way, not only in small chunks, but getting a sense of the whole. That's how you'll be able to locate all the texts that speak to your topic. It's not enough to look up specific words in an index or a dictionary or a concordance because sometimes a key passage may not use a technical word. So read, read, read. Read the Bible. And once you have all the biblical data, you need to ensure that you aren't simply using one verse as a proof text that you're taking it out of context and you're trying to force it to fit into a system. So each passage needs to be faithfully understood in its own immediate context and in its place within the entire unfolding biblical story. And keep in mind that many things change as you move from the Old Testament into the New Testament. A couple of our other core discipleship courses here at CCC will address some of those concerns. So pull together all of the pertinent and relevant biblical data. Third, survey the wisdom of church history. I've mentioned this already, but at this point, it's helpful to do some research beyond Scripture and to see what faithful believers have said about your topic from the early church up to the present day. This will provide you with some boundaries and guardrails for your thinking. It will keep you from possible heresy and from being deceived by false teaching or false thinking. If you have questions about reputable theologians and good things to read, please feel free to reach out to us and ask or talk to a solid and trusted local pastor. Fourth, use chastened biblical reasoning when you begin to pull everything together on your topic. Chastened in the sense that we recognize that our reasoning abilities are affected by sin. And so we must use our reasoning in a humble way in reliance on and submission to Christ and the Holy Spirit. We certainly never let our own reasoning, as sound as it may seem, trump what is clear in Scripture. But we can still use our reason. It is a capacity that God has given to us to aid us in our learning and our growth. Here's what Wayne Grudem has to say about using reason in a biblical way. We are free to use our reasoning abilities to draw deductions from any passage of Scripture so long as these deductions do not contradict the clear teaching of some other passage of Scripture. I might add that the Holy Spirit enables us to do this well. And it's why a prior faith commitment is so crucial in theology. But we don't set reason and rational thinking aside in theology. Far from it, rather we seek to hone and to cultivate such abilities in submission to Christ as Lord. Fifth, synthesize your findings in a succinct and contextual way. 
So this is where we pull together all of the data from our study and research into an understandable summary or system that is faithful to the whole of Scripture. Now, this can take a whole lot of different forms. It can be an annotated outline, a paper, a presentation, an audio lecture, something creative like poetry or drama or music, or perhaps, for most of us, just our own thoughts that we have written down in a journal. By necessity, this synthesis is a summary or abstraction from the Bible itself. It's one step removed from the biblical te text because we're trying to distill large principles and patterns of thought and reality. It wouldn't help us or anyone else to simply list all the passages and say, well, here's what the Bible says. We have to pull it all together in a way that highlights the key concepts and makes it understandable. It can take a lot of work and struggle and thinking and the use of logic to pull everything together in a, in a coherent and useful and faithful way. The more succinct that we can do that, the more apt we are to remember it ourselves and to help other people remember it. But you also have to articulate your findings in a contextualized way, meaning you have to use the language of your immediate context. Are you, a, are you writing a poem for kids about some area of doctrine, or are you giving an academic lecture? Plus, you need to show how these truths ought to be practically lived out in your own particular setting. Remember, theology is always done in the service of a local church to help individual Christians know and obey God. This contextualized communication, even when the same area of doctrine is being studied, will, will look different in various places around the globe. For example, if your topic was spiritual warfare, the sorts of practical applications you might make for your church in the United States will be very different than a local church in an animistic religious context in the deeps of Africa, where the application will need to be very practical and often urgent. Listen to this helpful quote from C.S. Lewis. You must translate every bit of your theology into the vernacular. This is very troublesome, and it means you can say very little in half an hour, but it is essential. It is also the greatest service to your own thought. I have come to the conviction that if you cannot translate your thoughts into uneducated language, then your thoughts were confused. Power to translate is the test of having really understood one's own meaning. Six and final step in our method of doing theology, obey what you have found to be true. Remember, theology isn't just about the intellect. Christian theology is the study and application of God's word by persons to all areas of contemporary life. We haven't done theology rightly if it hasn't transformed us in some way, shape, or form and made us to be more like Christ. Yes, that might primarily be in the way that we think about God. Not every doctrine will immediately affect outward behavior. But we must always give due diligence to thinking through all of the practical ramifications that a particular area of doctrine has on our lives. The challenge I leave you with for this session is a little more involved, but I hope that you might take me up on it. Over the next few days, spend some time studying the doctrine of Christian suffering in Peter's epistles, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Synthesize your findings in a succinct way and record your thoughts on how they might be practically lived out. So I'm already providing you with the topic, suffering, and the key question, how does the Apostle Peter view suffering? It will only take you about 20 or 30 minutes to read the two letters of Peter. And obviously this won't give you a whole Bible doctrine of suffering. But this will be a piece that would fit into a whole Bible doctrine of suffering if you wanted to expand your study at some point. But I think you'll find this a fun project and I hope a transformative one as well as you get to follow these steps of the method of doing theology. In our next video, we move into our first area of doctrine, the triune God or what is often called theology proper. I'll see you then.